is two minutes up, so I'm going to go ahead and do announcements. Um, so it's uh, been a while, but it's great to have you all back. Oh, a few more people coming in, very good. Um, and uh, so today will be the first time that we will do communion in this setting. So uh, you received uh, the individual cups when you came in. Hopefully you all have one of those. And uh, what we're going to do is we have a, a, a little video because they are a little kind of tricky. And so I just want to go over it. So, uh, so if you notice in your cup, the wafer is in the lid. Okay? And so to pull the, uh, uh, the wafer out, there's a white tab, which I, I, I must say that uh, Donna spent I don't know how long putting those little white tabs on all of these to make it easier for you. So you take the white tab and pull that back, and you can actually pull that back and loosen it now. Don't pull back all the way, but you can pull back and loosen it now. But that's where the wafer is, is inside that tap, top portion, okay? And then, uh, to get to the wine, uh, obviously you grasp the, uh, the plastic tab and carefully pull the tab back because you don't want to uh, pop it and get the, the, the wine all over yourself, okay? So just carefully pull it all back and uh, that's what you need to do for both the wine and the wafer. Now, the way we will do that in the service, okay, since everyone already has the elements in their hands, is that when it comes time to the words of institution, uh, where I say in the night in which we betrayed our Lord Jesus, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, saying take it, this is my body given for you. After that, I will say, the body of Christ given for you, and everyone will take the bread at that time. Then I will say the words of institution uh, around the wine, and then after the words of institution around the wine, you will drink that. That's a little bit different than what we normally do, because normally the words of institution happen, and then we do communion. Alright, but doing it in this way, in this context, that's the way it will happen. So just wanted you to all be prepared about these little cups, because I have I was in a church that used these before, we didn't use them for very long because people got very frustrated trying to, you know, get the bread and the wine out and, and so forth. But actually what Donna has done helps considerably uh, by putting those little white tabs on for you to get to the bread. Because that's the tricky part, is, is the, uh, actually the top for the bread. Alright, uh, any other announcements? Yeah.
I've had a lot of people say, you know, I really just wish there was something I could do. Well, let me find a list. Because <laughs> I can guarantee that there is. So if you're interested in helping out in any way, whether it's cleaning up, cleaning a bathroom, a classroom, wiping down some walls, just again, reach out to the office and let them know. Thank you. Okay, we'll begin our worship with the prayer. Of our life, 
be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Responsibly by the whole verse, Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's enemies. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems life and grace and crowns you with steadfast who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. Then he's reading us from the sixth chapter of Matthew. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I do just want to take a moment and mention the uh, Wednesday night Bible study also. It's uh, the, uh, our Bible study that's done via Zoom. I know there's a number of people here that, are, that have been a part of that. Uh, if it's something that you would like to be a part of, you can contact the office to get the information. Either just email Jan or I or call the office and uh, we can get the information about how to get into that. We're starting this Wednesday a new study on the book of Psalms. Uh, so that's what we'll be looking at. And uh, I think it's going to be about a 10 week study on the book of Psalms. And we'd love to have you join us. Uh, so, but uh, today uh, we continue with our series on the Lord's Prayer. We're actually finishing up our series on the Lord's Prayer today. And uh, last week we talked about the Father's forgiveness. If you had an opportunity to, to watch it online, and uh, this week, we're talking about the Father's guidance and the Father's protection. So, Jesus tells us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Now, the first thing to note here is that this part of the prayer moves us outward as a people of God. Uh, the first part of the Lord's Prayer is focused on our relationship with God, where we talk about God's character and God's kingdom. Uh, then uh, the next part of the prayer is focused on our relationship with, with others, with, uh, with the people around us and our lives when we, when we pray for God's provision and God's forgiveness. Uh, and now we address our relationship with the world. Lead us not. It's action oriented, right? It's movement. Lead us out into the world, Lord, where we can make a difference with our lives, where we can be extenders of the kingdom, where we will be living out our covenant relationship with you, where we can be men and women who are distinctive, where we can be salt and light in this world. 
And as we go out to do these things, the enemy will try to trap us, distract us. Our own fallen nature will try to pull us down. And we will get tempted by things in the world around us because there are so many things that can mess up what God is trying to do in and through us. So Jesus says, let's be praying to our Father that He would lead us, steer us, guide us to the path that holds the best plans for our lives. Now let's be clear also what we are and are not saying in this part of the Lord's Prayer, to lead us not into temptation. We are not saying that God tempts us. The Bible is clear that God does not tempt. Temptation is a seduction to do something wrong. That's not God's way. That's not the way God interacts with us. Listen to what it says in the book of James in the Bible. It says there, No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and He Himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. So God does not tempt, but God does test. See, the purpose of tempting is to pull you down. The purpose of testing is to build you up. Listen again to what it says in the book of James. It's written there, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and that endurance has its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Paul says something similar in the book of Romans. He says, and not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Or one more from 1 Peter. It says there, In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, to be tested by fire sounds pretty horrible, actually. But what does fire do to gold? It purifies it. It refines it. It makes the gold more valuable. That's what testing does for our faith. <clears throat> testing is a tool of God to build us up. Temptation is a tool of Satan to drag us down. So temptation is to be avoided. And we pray for God to help us do that, to guide us to the places He wants us to be. And this leads us to the final section of the Lord's Prayer, the Father's protection, because we have an enemy who is after us, who is after God's people. And if we keep on being led astray by his temptations, eventually we will end up in his hands. Jesus says this about the enemy, about Satan. Here he calls him the thief. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Satan wants to take everything away from us, especially our eternal destiny, our salvation. So Jesus tells us to pray, deliver us from evil, or deliver us from the evil one. 
Here's what Jesus is telling you. Be aware that you are in a battle. Spiritual warfare is a reality, people. And so we pray for God to keep us safe when we move through this life doing His will. And I think we tend to overlook this as Christians. I think in our overconfidence, in our development as a human race, and our unbridled belief in our ability to understand and explain everything, we have written off the idea that there is a spiritual world beyond ours and that the demonic is a very real thing. And that we are in a battle against these demonic forces. Perhaps one thing coming out of everything that's happened in 2020 is maybe we doubt that a little less right now. But when we look at the ministry of Jesus, when we look at his message, more than anything else, what Jesus talks about in the Gospels is about the kingdom of God and the coming reign of that kingdom. Mark chapter 1, Jesus' first words in his ministry are these. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come here. Repent and believe the good news. Now, here's why I bring that up, because as is always the case, when one kingdom moves forward, when one kingdom advances, it is at the expense of another kingdom. So when Jesus is talking about God's kingdom coming down and being present in this world, being present now in our lives, what Jesus is doing in that moment is that he is declaring war against the kingdoms of darkness. And, and we see, actually, in Mark chapter 1, if you read forward uh, the next few chapters after that, we see three things that take place right after he has declared war. We see the first battle. And then we see the first breakthrough of the kingdom. And then the first briefing. So when Jesus announces the, the coming of the kingdom of God, he is pronouncing war on enemies of God. He's pronouncing war on sin, sickness, death, and the devil. And right after making this declaration of war, Jesus comes face to face with the enemy. The very next thing that happens is a demon possession. And he casts out the demon. It's the first battle. And Jesus is victorious. And so what follows that first victory is breakthrough. He goes to the house of Simon. He heals everyone he touches. We're told the entire city of Capernaum gathers outside the house of Simon. And Jesus healed many, many people. And then before moving on from there, Jesus, the first in command, he needs to get his marching orders from the commander-in-chief. And it says in the Gospel of Mark, in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him, and when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I might proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And so Jesus has received his marching orders and the kingdom is to continue advancing and continue expanding its borders at the expense of the kingdoms of darkness. So what is Satan's strategy against the army of God? I think it's pretty clear what his strategy is. It's containment and confusion. Containment is Satan's strategy of keeping God's army, of keeping the disciples of Jesus Christ holed up inside their own borders. 
I think we see that so much in the church today where we are kind of gathered into our, our holy huddles and uh, not advancing out into the world, not taking the gospel message out into the world, not going out into the world as disciples of Jesus Christ. Again, I think this is one of the things that, the, one of the ways in which God is actually working through the pandemic is, is that churches have been forced to try to figure out ways to work outside their walls. And we're still struggling with that, but the churches that are, that will really come out of this and be the strongest in terms of, uh, of, of advancing in their mission will be those churches that continue try to identify those ways to move outside their walls and reach people. In our own synod, our own bishop has uh, identified and is encouraging the churches within our synod to take part in a, in a, uh, in a movement that's called Fresh Expressions. It is a movement that started in the Methodist Church and, and now we are bringing it here to our city also. And the whole idea of fresh expressions is for the people of God to get outside of their buildings and into the world as the church. And so in the movement of fresh expressions, for instance, there, there are what's called dinner church, where people gather every week at a dinner at a house uh, to share uh, that community together and then also to share God's word together and to grow together in that way and to invite others to, to, that, uh, to that movement. There's even a tattoo parlor church uh, where the people gather in this tattoo parlor and uh, uh, they do it and they encourage others to come, others who might not enter into a church building and they are advancing the kingdom God that way. There's, that's why it's called fresh expressions. There's all kinds of unique fresh expressions of the ch church that are happening. And this is something our bishop really wants to have happen within our synod. But that is one of Satan's strategies is containment to get the church to stay inside its own walls. And then confusion. Confusion, I think, that Satan's tactic here is to just simply have God's people to doubt the question that they are in a battle at all. To doubt the question that there really are forces out there that are working against the kingdom of God, that are working against the disciples of Jesus Christ, working against the church and the advancement of the good news of Jesus Christ. That there are forces that are actually actively trying to prohibit this, to fight against this. And we doubt that, we question that. And yet, the scriptures are so clear that that's the case. So by praying for God's guidance and deliverance, it keeps us focused on the task before us. We are in mortal combat with a foe so wicked, so evil, that we cannot win without the support of the King who has come to rule. Without Jesus, we would be defeated. Humanity would be defeated. With Jesus, though, we are victorious. We will be victorious. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. This is not a prayer of fear. We're not afraid of these forces of the world. We pray these words to claim the victory. We pray these words with the confidence that the powers of good will always, always overcome the powers of evil. We pray that, that God, knowing that God wants to do this in your life, He wants to offer you this guidance, He wants to protect you as you move forward as His disciple. And so you can pray these words with great boldness because God has great plans for your life.
Just let him lead you. Amen.
According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved in trouble or adversity, or sick and in need of care. We pray especially for those in our prayers, and for those whom prayer has been requested, especially Carolyn Anstead, Peggy and Ron, Lucy Young, for safe travel. Lord, in your mercy, You call us into the community of Toledo, in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts that you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, you are the everlasting rock from which we were hewn, and you restore your people to joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of our beloved dead, especially Karen DeWitts. Bring us with them to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, in this certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Take a moment where you are and stand and offer peace to one another. At this time we offer our offertory prayer, and the offering can be placed in the plate, which is out the back somewhere, yep, right straight out the back door, you can uh, drop your offering into that plate. But let us pray now for those offerings that we give. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts, that we may like, proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You have filled all creation with light and life, heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the, pro of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. The body of Christ given for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Christ is with you. Yes, Jesus. You may be seated.